Excellent. Hey guys, how's it going? And welcome to Paul's Hardware. Today's video is definitely a different type of video because I'm gonna be talking all day today. Well, all for the next maybe 10 or 20 minutes about net neutrality. Net neutrality is something that I feel very strongly about and it's something that not everyone is completely familiar with. There's some important stuff going on in the US government right now with regards to net neutrality and how internet service providers can treat the data that you get at home through your internet connection, whether that's provided through uh, a large internet service provider like Comcast or Verizon or Time Warner Spectrum, or whether you have a small internet service provider or whether you're lucky enough to have Google Fiber. But I'm joined today by none other than Wendell from Level One Techs. How's it going, Wendell? How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing Hello. great. Thank you so much for being here. I brought Wendell in because he's, he's very smart. He knows a lot about this subject. And although there are, of course, areas where both of us are not completely familiar, we have done a ton of research uh, to give you guys a lot of uh, feedback on this topic, to hopefully give you guys a quick rundown of how it's actually gonna work. And then we're also gonna do a follow-up video to this one on my channel, Paul's Hardware. We're gonna post a link in the video description to the level one text video where Wendell and I are gonna take a lot more time to go into more depth about a lot of these topics, talk about some specific scenarios and that kind of thing. So if you're not familiar with net neutrality, or if you know someone who isn't familiar and you wanna share some information with them that you feel is good, hopefully that's what we're gonna be bringing you right now. But let's start off from the very basics and what is net neutrality from the start. Uh, from my understanding, you have a connection to the internet, again, provided by your internet service provider, and packets of data go to and fro on that. You might be connecting to a server that's across the town, across your state, across the country, or, or around the world. That's the basis of the World Wide Web. You can go out on the internet, you can browse the public internet, and you can access it, you can load it up on your computer, you can interact with it however you want. Net neutrality is the basic premise that the packets of data being sent to and from your computer are treated equally, regardless of where they might originate from elsewhere on the internet. Um, that is currently upheld by what is called Title II. That allows the FCC to enforce net neutrality. Uh, so let's do a follow-up question, and what is Title II? And Wendell, maybe you could chime in here about this one and give a quick rundown of what Title II is. Title II is a section of the 96 Telecommunications Act, which is sort of the amendment and replacement of the 1934 Telecommunications Act that talks about what are called common carriers. You know, the instinct is to think about it in sort of technological terms, but common carrier, think about like, like riding the bus or getting from point A to point B. A common carrier is it's going to shuttle your data from A to B. It doesn't really care what the data is. It doesn't really care about anything like that. Telephone, it's like I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call, you know, Bob three states over. It's going to be a long distance call. The companies, there's more than one company involved with that, obviously. And the companies that are carrying that phone call can be said to be common carriers. They don't need to be concerned with the content. You know, if you and Bob are planning a bank robbery or whatever, the content of your call just doesn't concern the company. They're, they're a common carrier. They're absolved of legal liability. They're, they're just carrying the communication. And so ISPs are now classified as, uh, you know, sort of Title II communications providers, meaning that they provide the infrastructure necessary for communications and they don't interfere with or concern themselves with the contents of that communication. Now, our stance, um, based on our discussion leading up to this video, is that net neutrality is a good thing. And if you look at it from sort of just the basic uh, idea of what it actually is, and as Wendell has described just now, your data going to and fro, the, or the data of the website you're trying to access, uh, should just be sent one from one point uh, to the other, and of course bounce through the internet uh, to get where it's gonna go. The enforcement of net neutrality, or the ability for a government agency to say to your internet ser ser service provider, hey, you need to treat the data in this way, is currently upheld by the fact that uh, we have Title II classification of internet service providers as common carriers. Now there are other ways, potentially, that net neutrality could be enforced, and um, the the best theoretical alternative is simply via competition. So that idea is that, well, you could have net neutrality if you have a bunch of diff different internet service providers. If one internet service provider says, hey, I'm gonna give you access to the entire internet for this base price, and that's what you get, 
you'll probably be pretty happy with that. If you have another, another internet service provider who says, here's your cost for your internet, and then, hey, if you wanna access Netflix, we're gonna charge you an extra 10 bucks. If you wanna access this website, we're gonna charge you an extra fee for that. If you wanna access uh, services for apps or that kind of thing, they might add, it, add an additional fee for that. That isn't allowed with the current Title II classification, but it could potentially be allowed if uh, internet service providers were not classified as common carriers under Title II. If they move them to Title I, for example, which is uh, how they were classified briefly. And uh, again, in our lengthier follow-up video to this, we're gonna go into a bit more of the history of that. But our stance is that net neutrality is good, however it's enforced, but the way the internet is currently deployed in the United States right now is such that most people actually don't have competition. So in the absence of being able to enforce net neutrality through natural competition and choice between internet service providers, one which might treat your data the way you want to, one which might throttle it or slow it down when you're accessing different websites. Data, I think, unnecessarily complicates things in, in most people's minds. Think about like the water company or the power company, and it's like, I, there needs to be three competing power companies in my area to provide electricity so that we get the best, most capitalistic way of doing that. It's like, no, I don't, I don't think that makes logical sense. Three competing power companies would probably all have inferior infrastructure to one properly want run power company in an area supplying electricity to that area. Uh, it's kind of the same way with the local network infrastructure, but not necessarily the internet connection itself. And so this, this is kind of thing is called a natural monopoly. And so like your telecommunication stuff, there kind of is a natural monopoly to provide that. And think about like your cable TV provider and the telephone company, like what historically were two different services, both bringing a copper line to your house. Now you can do the same because everything's digital. You can do the same kind of thing over either connection. So you've already got a little bit of redundancy in your, in your infrastructure if you're fortunate enough to be in an area with two different providers. But most of these companies have conglomerated to the point that there's not really a lot of overlap in, uh, in competition in, in, a, in a given geographical area. So in the absence of competition, our stance is that Title II is the proper way to enforce net neutrality right now. Uh, the FCC, however, uh, currently has what is called a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, going on. They're calling it restoring internet freedom. Uh, and they're gonna be voting on it on December 14th. Uh, in about, uh, well, a little, about a week and a half. Um, basically, the expectation is that the FCC is going to vote along party lines, Republicans versus Democrat. We don't like to phrase this as a political issue. However, that's how it's falling out right now. Unfortunately, there might be people who lean left or right when it comes to the political spectrum who might get uh, an idea of how they feel about this based on their political leanings rather than the facts. But that's why we're trying to uh, bring you guys more facts today. We're gonna do this with a little bit of structure in that uh, I happen to follow a few of the members of the FCC on Twitter. Brendan Carr tweeted this out uh, just last week and he posted a piece intended to debunk what he calls the babble of other misinformation. This is actually posted directly to the FCC website. All the articles that we're talking about today, by the way, are linked in this video's description, so check them out there. This is a list of the Net neutrality myths, according to the FCC, and his response in what he is calling facts that counter each of those myths. We're gonna go down this list, point for point, and we're gonna show you why we feel you're very much being misled by this document in particular, and why we feel like the FCC's actions they're about to take are misguided, and that they should probably do things a little bit differently. It's so hard not to wax poetic at great length, but we're going to keep it short for you guys. <laughs> That's the goal. I don't know. I don't know how long this intro has been so far, but let's 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 plow through, and we'll start off with the first one: the general myth. This is the end of the internet as we know it, and of course, there's been lots of discussion online because lots of people like the internet. So people are rightfully upset and angry uh, that the internet might change, or especially that they might somehow need to pay more for the internet. Um, that's really what it boils down to, a lot of it, how much the internet costs and how much people are gonna have to pay for it. Now the statement made here is that the internet was free and open before the Obama administration's 2015 heavy-handed Title II internet regulations, a phrase that's repeated often and very often. They can't seem to 
to list these as Title II regulations <laughs> without referring it to its full title, the Obama administration's 2015 heavy-handed Title II internet re regulations. But Woo! that language aside, um, first off, if you look at what the internet service providers are trying to do, uh, they've indicated in the past that they're uh, somewhat excited for net neutrality rules to go away. And in fact, when it comes to court proceedings, they've specifically stated that they're intending to do segmentation and to favor some preferred, preferred services content or sites over others. Not only that, but uh, there is the potential introduction of legislation to prohibit states from enforcing net neutrality. So if you're a states' rights kind of person and you don't like the feds coming in and telling you what to do, but you do like net neutrality, uh, they might be going in and telling your state that, by the way, uh, we have decided that net neutrality shouldn't be a thing, therefore you cannot decide that as a state either, which uh, doesn't seem necessarily right to me. Yay, all... states' rights, woo! <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, what now? Uh, <laughs> that's... Yeah, I don't know. Um, there's also a lot of history going on here. And again, there's uh, been several uh, court cases regarding this where um, internet service providers have had to go in and had to make statements in court, which um, when you make a statement in court, you kind of have to tell the truth. Otherwise, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so there are some additional documentation, some more links uh, about uh, prior to 2014. Uh, when Real, when uh, Tom Wheeler, the previous uh, FCC chairman, reclassified Title I to Title II. Um, the article on The Verge uh, specifically talks about the death of the internet, uh, how the FCC lost net neutrality and could kill the internet. Uh, but uh, Wendell, did you, did you have something to comment on about this one? That was, that, the Verge article is actually before Wheeler reclassified them. And so okay. it's, it's, it's almost a little bit of foreshadowing because... It talks about how oh this wasn't you know classified right this doesn't have the thing and that and that kind of makes sense you have to understand that before they were Title Two they really were Title One they, they that is not the every great lie has a little has a little bit of a, of, of truth in it and this is the same thing in this guy's response and so he's just saying well you know it, it did really well under Title One but the whole reason that Wheeler felt that he had to reclassify them from Title One to Title Two was because of specific cases of shenanigans that we're going to talk about. But you also say in the, the 2013 case where the FCC and Verizon were having an argument over exactly this not being free and open and treating things equal, that the actual quote says, I'm authorized to state for my client today, but for, but for these rules, we would be exploring those types of arrangements, meaning the, the whole, you know, the destination pays, which is not a good thing. So the judge asked very directly, do you plan to treat certain internet traffic differently from others? And their answer was yes, absolutely we have these plans and were these rules not in effect, that's what they intend to do. So the statement that the internet isn't going to change is definitely not correct in that regard. If you want a little bit more, uh, check out this Free Press article on the brief history of net neutrality violations, starting out in 2005, leading up to 2007, 2010, all the way up to um, 2012, and even beyond some uh, stuff that happened uh, past that. But uh, the brief history, um, for, if, if you're looking at the past eight years or so, in 2013 and 2014 was when this really became kind of more of a big deal. Uh, a lot of that had to do with uh, the increase in popularity in Netflix, also the increase in bandwidth usage by Netflix, and the decision by a lot of internet service pro providers to then throttle them. That led to a lot of uh, debates in 2013 and 2014. It led to some attempted legal actions by the FCC that were opposed by internet service providers, which then led to the FCC deciding, all right, we're gonna make you Title II, and that will allow us to enforce net neutrality. Net neutrality has been a thing and has been enforced under Title II since 2015. We're living in a world with net neutrality enforced by the FCC. They're trying to change that and take that away. So At the risk of running just a bit long, it's also important to understand that that before, like from, so 96, 1996 allowed these mergers to take place. And in almost every case, when the FCC allowed a merger or reviewed a merger, you can look at the memos going back, you know, 2005, 2000, uh, when these different companies were merging, like when GTE merged, I think it was GTE and Bell Atlantic merged, that, that became Verizon, uh, who's at issue here. And in the memo for those types of mergers, a lot of the time the FCC would say, look, we, we don't want you to do any kind of this stuff that you're trying to pull with the FaceTime and the Google Wallet and like AT&T with FaceTime and Verizon with Google Wallet, which we'll talk more about later. 
uh, we don't want you to do anti-net neutrality stuff in these memos for the mergers. And, and in general, these companies agreed with those memos. And it's like, all right, we'll let you merge. But remember, you got to be good citizens. And then they started being bad citizens and, and Wheeler had had enough of it. So there is an obvious sort of leading up to the action that was taken in 2015. And it seems to us that a lot of the arguments being made by the internet service providers right now of saying like, look, we don't need rules to enforce this, just make it on the honor system. We'll, ha we'll disclose to people what we're doing and, that, and, and just leave it at that. There's plenty of evidence. And again, more of this on the, the video over on Level 1 Techs. Plenty of evidence to show how internet service providers have not been doing that in the least bit. And uh, there's no indication of why they would some, somehow change in 2017 now uh, as compared to what they were doing leading up to 2015. All right, let's move on to uh, item number two, though, on this list. Uh, the myth is that startups will not be able to compete with Title II regulations. Uh, the myth, according to the FCC. And their fact is that entrepreneurs starting new businesses online thrived long before Title II regulations and will continue to flourish with more opportunities to innovate. Uh, companies like Google, Facebook, Netflix, and Twitter all started and experienced tremendous to tremendous growth under previous light, light touch rules. And that is true to an extent, um, but I think you have to take into consideration the context of the internet being somewhat in its infancy stages, or at least its toddler stages uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, also, the fact that as Wendell has already stated, uh, this, it's, it hasn't exactly been the same regulatory framework going back prior to 2015. How this fails to explain how Title II is in any way cumbersome for startups and entrepreneurs. That's that's also true. <laughs> uh, see, see, and that's how deceptive language can be deceptive. I sort of just read it and took it as fact that like, oh well, yeah. But um, that's definitely worth pointing out that uh, there's no counter that's really being presented here. Explain to me again how sheep's bladders may be employed to prevent earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, how are you, who are you who are so wise in the ways of science? Uh, all right. One more thing to add to that is that if you look at these uh, thriving entrepreneurial uh, internet-based businesses, such as Netflix, for example, as they have grown and gotten larger, some of their opinions when it comes to regulations have sort of changed. For example, the Net, uh, Netflix CEO, Netflix was a champion of net neutrality, and we are using them as an example for many of the points we're making today, but as they've gotten gotten bigger and as they have become an incumbent provider, uh, as compared to, I don't know, what Blockbuster, who, who counts before that, but uh, they've changed their stance on net neutrality many times. And now that they are in a position where they're gonna benefit from net neutrality not being a thing anymore because they are so entrenched in the existing marketplace, uh, they're not necessarily opposed to net neutrality Rolling back. Of course, they keep going back and forth on this because there's a lot of public opinion on it as well, and that can sway how they uh, behave. But it just goes to show that I don't think the argument of all of the existing large internet companies doing well is one that says, oh, yeah, it was just fine how it was, so let's go back to how it was. I mean, if anything, if you really want to take this apart, you could say that Google, Facebook, and Netflix have the ability to pay off companies under Title I as they have said that they want because – you know, the specific, again, we'll talk more about it later, but the FaceTime thing where AT&T was blocking FaceTime unless you paid more, that seems like not something an entrepreneur could deal with, but whereas Apple could. Yes. So obviously um, the ability of someone to start a brand new company out of nothing is one of the great wonders of the internet. Um, and if there is the capability of an internet service provider to block and throttle traffic, then there's definitely the chance of large incumbent providers of whatever it might be, whether it's a retailer or a media service or something like that, blocking out smaller companies and not giving them a foothold to even get started. Moving on to number three, uh, so they, their claim that the myth is that internet service providers will block you from visiting websites you want to visit. Uh, they say that the internet service providers didn't block websites before these regulations and they won't after. Well, they didn't block websites before. They blocked a protocol. It was BitTorrent. <laughs> That's what that <laughs> yeah. means, right? The, yeah, well, Bit, BitTorrent and, and also websites they don't like, which um, oh, might it was include... text messages. It was text messages, too. 
text, text messages. messages from a political group and Verizon was like, no, we're not having this. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, so I mean, th this is the other thing. Like th this, this also crosses over and bleeds into not just like, well, I want my data and my internet access because I like to go there and watch movies and whatever. Like we're talking about the potential for influencing the actual like news and information that people get. Um, if you have someone who feels strongly politically one way or another who is behind one of these large companies, you might potentially they might be able to influence what you see and block you from seeing stuff that they disagree with, and that's a pretty big deal. Uh, but also just the fact that they've done it before, very obviously, which directly con counters what he just said. Here is a chart from 2013 and 2014 showing Netflix speeds. This is just the most well-known example, but uh, go back to that list of uh, net neutrality violations that we started off with, and there's other examples in there too. The, f the idea that this hasn't happened before is simply false. Uh, number four, though, investment has flourished under the current regulatory framework. They're saying is a myth. They're saying that following this regulation in 2015, broadband investment has fallen for two years in a row, and it's the first time that that has happened in the internet era. So first refutation of that uh, is an ARAS Technica article. Uh, the FCC chair, Ajit Pai, has been accused of ignoring investment data, uh, specifically pushing the narrative that there's been no investments in uh, broadband infrastructure. Now there's a huge, oh my gosh, huge issue when it comes to investment in broadband infrastructure, and we're gonna be diving into that on Wendell's video, and oh my gosh, it's crazy. Like all of this stuff, all of this discussion, all of the arguments we're having right now I feel like has this, this big old elephant in the room underneath it all, which is that we were all supposed to have really good fiber by now. Yeah. Um, but, but, we'll, but we'll get to that. I, ignoring that completely, <laughs> which we shouldn't. But ignoring that, looking at broadband investment over the past uh, seven years, at least from 2010 to 2016, shows that it's, uh, it fluctuates. It actually goes up and down. Sometimes there's more investment, sometimes there's less investment. The vagaries have not been taken into account by Ajit Pai. And in fact, there are cycles of investment within this framework. Uh, 2011 to 2012, there was an 18.9% growth. 2012 to 2013, 10.1% growth. And then while still under light touch regulatory framework, 2013 to 2015, investment declined. So stating broadly that investment has declined since 2015 is again, simply false. I'll also point out that Google, like them or hate them, gosh darn it, they've been trying to invest in broadband deployment, but they've just been, they've been having a real hard time getting that fiber on those poles. Yeah, it seems, <laughs> seems like they should be having an easier time with that. Um, everywhere I've heard about Google going and deploying Google Fiber has been very positive, but um, they're, they're having some challenges, it appears, when it comes <laughs> Ooh, to- Oh, he's trying. <laughs> to getting, through those, getting those approvals uh, pushed through the courts, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're having to fight lawsuits tooth and nail, and it's like, no, this isn't legit, and no, stop doing this, and no, this is our monopoly, and it's like, well, you know, this wouldn't be a problem if you had reasonable internet in this area to begin with. Yeah, uh, so, and again, everyone should have that <laughs> more, more on Wendell's. And Wendell's video. Uh, let's move on to point number five, though. You won't be charged a premium to access any part of the public internet if this passes. This is, this is my paraphrasing of what they're saying. Broadband providers will not charge you a premium if you want to reach certain online content. Uh, the fact is that they are free to charge you a premium for specific websites and web services if they want, if the current plan goes through and net neutrality uh, strict rules are revoked. Um, but they don't necessarily even have to do that if they don't want to. There's other ways of getting more money uh, out of your internet connection without even charging you more directly. For example, uh, back when Netflix did the slowdown, Comcast forced them to pay money. So it doesn't necessarily need to come from you as the end user. They can attempt to charge uh, the actual or, uh, originators of the data that you are getting. Um, in this example, um, Netflix actually paid Comcast, and that's what resulted in suddenly their uh, Netflix speeds uh, to their customers going up. Or, uh, you know, just reclassify stuff. It seems like a protection racket, doesn't it? It's like, oh, I don't have a lot of packets you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to them. That would, that would suck. I mean, <laughs> you never know where those, pa those packets might disappear to. Maybe a Jeep is going to try to convince us that we can apply RICO laws in that case when uh, something happens to all your packets, that it's some kind of, like... <laughs> criminal criminal cartel that's abducting your packets or something. 
<laughs> where, where do all the lost packets end up? That's, <laughs> they're probably stockpiling them. Um, that's, my, that's my theory. Weaponized lost packets. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, this, these, uh, the other option that they can do if they don't want to just charge uh, where the data is coming from is they can zero rate data. Um, and zero rating uh, is where they have a sp specific set of media content they, they might deliver to you that isn't charged against your internet service plan. So the data rates don't apply in those cases. Now, on the face of it, zero rating actually seems like a pretty appealing thing to a consumer because it's like, oh, I can watch all these movies for free. But it is leading down a path towards darkness because zero rating actually effectively causes the rest of the contents to cost more money. Maybe not necessarily in some configurations of it. T-Mobile had a, had a system that was actually okay by the FCC back during uh, 2015 and 2016. But that zero was, rating- That was sorry. because wireless providers were specifically exempted from the Title II stuff, which I thought was pretty interesting. There we go. And then uh, wireless providers were included. Wait, weren't they? They, they were included in 2015. They were. They there were there were some rules that they had to follow, but largely they were excluded um, because of the limited aggregate total global bandwidth of, of that medium, the the last mile bandwidth or whatever. So it's kind of complicated, but um, in general, I would say that it's not. It's like. It's bad when your ISP and a content provider can get together for competition. Because imagine, you know, Netflix does zero rating, for example, with T-Mobile. Imagine a competing service like Netflix that pops up. They wouldn't necessarily be in a, in a position to negotiate those zero rating uh, fees with, with the provider. They may, not, they may not be able to get the time of day. And so does that mean that they're going to have to go with like a third-party CDN to deliver that content? Or does that mean... I mean, that just seems like that's setting up infrastructure to lock in incumbents, which two incumbents working together historically is, you know, generally a thing that actually happens. So, yeah, the, the, if you go far enough down that path, you end up with, say, you know, if you have four major Internet service providers in the, in the country and they're all tied to media uh, uh, companies, then you would basically sign up for the Internet service provider and their media and then if you want access to any of the other stuff, maybe you have to pay more for the cross access to the other network. Obviously, that's sort of a worst case scenario, but that is um, sort of the negative side of zero rating, I suppose. Uh, but let's move on to item number six. Current regulations hurt competition between ISPs and dis deter small internet service provider startups. And this actually, of all of the items on this list, I found to have the most sort of partial sheen of truth to it, because as we've already uh, discussed in today's video, there are limitations to Title II classifications, there are additional regulations, and it does make it more difficult for, say, a startup ISP to get started. I think this one we're going to cover a lot more in the other video, because if you want to open that Pandora's box, <laughs> let's talk about why those ISPs are classified as information services rather than common carriers in the first place. And that was because in the 96 Telecommunications Act, these ISPs agreed to open up their local infrastructure for all. And so they, in order to bring you what they called video dial tone services, they wanted to say, hey, we want to separate the local network company from the data services that run on it. So when you get a fiber optic connection to your building, your house, your outhouse, your garage, your you know whatever, uh, that it's just a local data connection. You're not actually connected to the internet. And then when you sign up with WorldCom or you know Bell Atlantic or whoever, that actually gets you on the internet or this information service or this video service with these TV channels and this other video service with these other TV channels. And it is kind of, I mean, they were kind of describing Netflix and Hulu and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that that if the local loop were unbundled and you could sign up with multiple data providers and it all ran over the same network, then there probably would be some truth to this. But I think if you're going to say this, you can't ignore the other thing. And uh, the fact is that if you look at the United States, uh, there's something like 50 million homes that do not have a broadband, uh, do not have more than one option for a broadband internet connection. And um, that's, a, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, because, again, the natural uh, competition that would lead to the enforcement of net neutrality um, just simply doesn't exist for about half of Americans. Now, <laughs> the, the, the way that this is being dealt with, which is a really, really kind of stupid way um, it, 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 to, to sort of tell people, no, you do have choice, you do have 
competition is actually lowering broadband standards or lowering the standard for what is classified as broadband. Um, we moved up to 25 megabits per second from I think four megabits per second. Uh, and I forget when that was, that was something like five or six years ago, I believe. Uh, they wanna lower it, lower it back from 25 back to 10, uh, which is just a step in the, in the wrong direction. We want faster internets. We want more bandwidth, not the other way around. The other thing uh, that they're potentially doing is telling you that if you have a wireless connection for a cell phone, that that counts. Like as long as you've got enough data bandwidth on your wireless connection, then that's your broadband internet connection. Uh, but these obviously aren't viable solutions, especially for Never mind that five gig cap. Yeah, especially for anyone trying to, <laughs> to run a business. Um, but yeah, rolling back standards, so suddenly telling you you have more, more competition than you actually do for an actual wired broadband connection, very, very, uh, very disingenuous, very misleading. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna slip in there that in 1996, broadband, the broadband promise for 2005 was 45 megabit symmetrical upload and down. There's a lot of people out there that would kill for 45 meg um, upload. When, when were, were we supposed to have that, Wendell? 2005. 2005? 12 years yes. ago, like, and, and there's the deployment was supposed to be like nationwide, right? Like a very high... Universal. Yeah. So it's, it's like you've got a utility outhouse where your well pump is, where it's pumping your well water and running it to your house. Yeah, that's going to have a fiber optic connection. Every structure in America, <laughs> 45 megabit. My God. Uh, all right. <laughs> so we, we need... I'm going to try to, to, to really plow through the rest of these so we can get to more on that on, on Wendell's side because we have yet to, to record that bit yet. Uh, but let's let's talk about some of these other ones. Um, number seven is that uh, fast lanes. Well, the myth is that this will result in fast lanes and slow lanes. That's what a lot of people talk about. And your data will go into a slow lane unless you pay more money. That is the general fear. Um, but this actual response that they did here doesn't say that that's not actually going to happen. They didn't even really respond to that. This will result in fast lanes and slow lanes on the internet and worsen customers' experience. They, didn't, they say it will lead to better, faster, and cheaper broadband for consumers and startups. But that doesn't say there will be no fast lanes and slow lanes. Uh, what's, what's, what's really exciting here is that, that we've already, and we already covered this, is that the terms like fast and slow, those are relative terms. Oh, yes. And it's like, oh, 25 is too fast. Let's redefine fast <laughs> as 10. So we'll just reclassify that. <laughs> Change the yeah. meaning of the word. So <laughs> we don't have an article to link you guys to respond to this because it doesn't even seem like they're attempting to, to tell you that that's not going to be a thing. But yeah. Uh, maybe have some expectations that there will be fast lanes and slow lanes if this actually happens. Uh, there is a Portugal internet meme bouncing around the internet. I'll be honest, I actually brought this up in one of our live shows. Uh, the meme itself isn't necessarily... Uh, it, you can't directly apply it to the current net neutrality argument, but there's an article on The Verge that uh, deals with this a little bit more. Um, Basically, Portugal is part of the EU, and the EU actually does have some pretty good uh, net neutrality rules. But what this does refer to is the ability in this package to pay a little bit more money to get some effectively zero-rated additional uh, data. So if you use a lot of social or you use a lot of email or you use a lot of music, you can pay an extra five euro a month to give yourself an additional cap that goes only towards that specific thing that you paid for. This is essentially sort of a, a strange means of zero rating. Uh, it's sort of in that same family. Um, but since it was brought up on the list, we thought we would at least address, address it briefly. Uh, and there is an article that you guys can check out on that one. Uh, next up, the myth is Title II regulations are good for innovation, and the fact presented is uh, that these regulations are in fact not good for innovation, and they list a single instance of one major internet service provider that put on hold its plans to build out-of-home Wi-Fi network because of uncertainty surrounding the rules. I feel like, given that there are other links in this article that have some backups or whatever, they might come up with more than one example or at least give us something to go on based on that. Uh, anyway, I, I feel like that one's a little nebulous, so we'll move on. Uh, the next one is reversing Title II regulations will comprise consumers' online privacy. And privacy, of course, is a big deal for a lot of people who want to maintain uh, online privacy. But uh, this one, there's actually a CNN article about. Uh, this was back in April, and this was one of the actions of the current FCC, uh, right? <laughs> so, 
if they're trying to tell us that our, our privacy will be better, then why are their current actions already enabling our browser history to be sold by our internet service providers to advertisers? So I think that the quickest fix for this is for somebody to get a hold of some important person's browsing history and you know what, what kinds of terrible sites they go to, and it'll be taken care of. The, the example I always like to cite is the uh, uh, VHS. Remember, remember, remember tapes? Like videotapes, <laughs> uh, some some uh, reporter got a hold of some Congress critter's VHS rental records, and you can imagine like how much pornography that particular oh, yeah. Congress critter rented. And so immediately in federal law, we have the you know protecting the the, the video records act. <laughs> it became it became a high priority very quickly in that instance. So um, yeah, some some sort of uh, misuse of that uh, with regards to someone in Congress, I think probably might uh, be the best option for uh, helping them preserve our, our online privacy. But also, how, um, how sad is it that your VHS rental records have more protections under the law than your, than your browsing history? <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, you, can't, you, can't, you can't point out these, these things when we're, we're trying to... <laughs> we, we, at level one, we've considered making a medic alert bracelet and selling it on our store that says, delete my browsing history. That'd be a good one. That'd be a good one. <laughs> That, or just have it tattooed across your chest, along with do not resuscitate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, all right, the next one I was a little confused about. Repealing Title II regulations will make it harder for disadvantaged Americans to get online. This isn't something that I've heard argued very much, so I don't have a direct response to it. Um, but apparently this might be an issue. Honestly, we're talking about the cost of the internet, and we're also talking about how much investment internet service providers have made in the internet for Americans again, according to the agreements that they've made with the federal government, that seems like the best option to get people cheap internet rather than providing internet service providers with a means of charging people more money. Uh, that just seems seems like a kind of a... Maybe like they're, that, they're looking obvious, for right? ways to subsidize this because uh, I think Verizon has the thing where you can opt into their super privacy invading thing and they'll give you a few bucks off your, your monthly plan. Oh, yeah, uh, and it just tracks everything you do. Yeah, turns so on all your mics. Maybe, the but they didn't come right out and say that, so I feel like that the, they probably responded that way for this one, but that's sort of in, in conflict with the one talking about privacy, huh? Yeah, it kind of is. Um, yeah, you have you can choose, you have your options. You can either have privacy or you can have money, but you cannot have both. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, there's three more items on the list. First one here is federal, the FTC. Uh, they're going to handle it. Don't worry about it. We'll just give all the internet regulation uh, responsibilities to the to the FTC rather than the FCC. We're going to go into this on uh, Wendell's video because uh, there's some legalities involved and it bears a little bit more uh, explanation and we've already gone way longer in my short video than we intended to. The final one on the list is that you can't abandon court approved Title II rules without a change in circumstances and specifically refers to the Supreme Court. Now, this is just a little frustrating, again, going all the way back to what the FCC is doing right now with their intent to create laws that will prevent, for instance, states from creating net neutrality rules. Obviously, the Supreme Court has weighed in already on the decisions that have been made uh, with regards to net neutrality. But um, this is just one of those legal arguments, I believe, like, oh, the court uh, approved, uh, the court's already approved it, so you can't change it. Um, that is not the case right now. But um, the final one here, and this one we all, we'll talk a little bit about, is the, the commentary process. The FCC actually introduced the Notice of Propos Proposed Rulemaking back in May. They had a commentary. Uh, you, you could go online and go to the FCC website and post the comments on it. There were 20, more than 22 million comments filed. Uh, the response by the FT FCC to the comments is very... Strange, because on the one hand, it seems like they're saying, hey, we opened up these comments so the public could comment and let us know what they feel. On the other hand, the commenting process is not an opinion poll and for good reason. And uh, the chairman's plan is based on facts and law rather than quantity of comments. So go ahead and comment so we can know how you feel and then completely ignore what your comments actually say because we're worried about the law rather than the quantity of comments. Um, there were some statements made up about this regarding like, oh, we're gonna t only going to take your comment seriously if you have like some legal framework going on in there or something like that. But regardless of all that, the comments themselves have been 
grossly compromised, according to just about anyone that you talk to about it. Uh, in fact, there's a Pew Internet article here that has a bunch of screenshots of it going through, and you can just see from there, uh, they, they pulled data uh, directly using the FCC's uh, uh, internet portal. And for instance, thousands of submissions feature duplicate names, 16, 17,000 uh, comments, the name was just net neutrality. 7,400 was just the internet. Um, there's also a breakup of the different, different all, all the different comments and, and whatnot, but essentially there's a ton of repeat comments. Uh, there were a ton of uh, times when a bunch of comments were submitted all at the same time. Uh, there was an API that was set up that they believe was being taken advantage of in order to submit bulk duplicate comments. Uh, there was accusations that there was a uh, DDoS attack on the FCC right after there was a bunch of promotion about this going on and that suddenly the people couldn't submit comments and uh, there, there's a lot of mystery surrounding what went on with that. <laughs> My favorite part was the alphabetical names, like the names were showing up in alphabetical order as if, so we got all these hundred thousand people together and it's like, Aaron A something, like, yeah. it's your turn, all right? So, <laughs> so there's obviously, obviously 22 million comments were not all submitted by your average American who wanted to go in there and let the FCC know what their thoughts were on net neutrality. Now, um, Brandon Carr's comment here in his publication specifically singles out pro Title II net neutrality uh, comments that were submitted multiple times, like very specifically 7.8 or 7.5 million submitted with the same sentence uh, in association with only 50,000 unique names and, and addresses. If you read this, your impression is that all of the falsely submitted comments were for net neutrality. Not true, not true in the slightest. In fact, uh, the best uh, sort of breakdown that I've seen of it looks at all of those comments, removes anything that's duplicate, and yes, we know that probably removes pro and anti-net neutrality comments, and just looks at the remainder. If you, if you take that all out, there's only about 2%, I believe, that are actual uh, unique comments, and of that 2%, 98.5% of the original comments are in favor of net neutrality, or alternatively phrased, oppose killing net neutrality. Uh, and there's a uh, tech dirt article on, on that there. So it seems like if you look uh, directly at the comments that are unique, and in my opinion, if you're getting that many false comments, these are the ones that you should probably trust, that it does seem like most people, in fact, the vast majority of people are in favor of net neutrality and are in favor of it being enforced the way it currently is enforced. Alternatively, maybe some of the people who are calling for the FCC to take a closer look at this before they go ahead and vote on December 15th, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should wait. Uh, that's the other option because there is obviously some shenanigans going on with all that. And uh, I, I certainly would like to know more about it before they go ahead and vote this thing through. I'm all for a democratic process. It does make sense to me that you wouldn't want the unwashed masses dictating everything. But I think that there's a there's a different take, a different approach that, that Ajit Pai could take on this, which is to just look at the transgressions that led from the original Title I to Title II reclassification and what led from the 1934 Telecommunications Act to the 1996 Telecommunications Act and say, you know what? AT&T and Comcast and some of these other companies, they were doing something that isn't right and that is actually anti-competitive. And we are going to do this and this when we roll them back to Title I to make sure this doesn't happen. I think that they would probably be better off to just do more forbearance. When, when Wheeler enacted Title II, there was about 700 things that he uh, said that these don't apply. And that's, that's a mechanism called forbearance. And so I think a Jeep Pie could do that under Title II. He's like, hey, you know what? We found that these other things in Title II that are too restrictive for these companies, and they've got some really good idea for business and commerce. We're going to add these to the list of things under Title II that companies don't need to follow. And I think that just, just even some inkling that he's considering that would probably go a long way from the PR aspect. But I just I haven't seen any of that in any of the press release or any of the material or any kind of hint that anybody is actually trying to do a reasonable and intelligent analysis of the situation. It seems like weighing both sides of the arguments um, in the arguments we're seeing for what they're doing, uh, what they're planning to do would, uh, yeah, it, it would 
relieve a lot of people's uh, concerns over what's going on. And it would at least make you feel like, hey, this is an agency that's supposed to be there to help Americans. It's supposed to be there to provide people with equal access uh, to regulate communications in such a way that the companies that control those, uh, the, the, the infrastructure and the connection uh, can't take advantage of people. And it doesn't seem like the actions that they're going forward with are doing that or are even taking into account that, hey, here is what would be best for people. It seems like all of the arguments are basically taking what the internet service providers have been saying will be best for them and sort of pasting it over and saying, look, here's how, why we're doing this and uh, we're gonna do it regardless of what you tell us. Um, but anyway, this video has been much longer than was anticipated. I'll be honest, I anticipated it was gonna go long anyway. We're gonna do another one on Wendell's channel. Uh, so we're gonna do that right now. I'm gonna post a link to that in this video description. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and sticking with us, with us the entire way. I know this is a sort of a weighty, dense issue and really appreciate you taking the time to give it your full thought and consideration. And of course, if you guys wanna post some comments in the comment section down below, you are welcome to do that. Uh, hit the thumbs up button too if you enjoyed this video. I'll be back with more content that's a little bit more tech related and not so much net neutrality related very soon. Wendell, thank you again so much for being here today and for participating in this little video collaboration. Thank you for having me, it's been amazing. Of course, uh, links to Wendell's channel down there too. Go subscribe, level one text, they do great work. Thanks for watching again, guys. We'll see you next time.